this is our second segment of the sedimentary rock and I just finished with the mud cracks so let's move on to the graded bedding when you have graded bedding uh, usually that means that from the shallow water uh, turbidity currents are going to bring down the sediment and they will settle down in the deep water when this turbidity current comes down and brings all the sediment with different grain sizes as it starts settling down of course always which which grain size is gonna settle down first yes right the biggest the biggest grain size settle down first and on top you always get the fine grains so you're gonna have one layer in which the sediment is uh, is um, being laid down based on grain size so we call it graded bedding the coarse grains are going to be on the bottom and the fine grains are going to be on the top. And then when you have another turbidity current, then it's going to happen the same way. So you're going to end up lay with sedimentary layers inside which you have graded beddings. So that's what I call. Usually that means big, big, big storms, hurricanes, or it could be earthquakes. Earthquakes uh, are going to do very similar things. The last of the sedimentary structures are the trace fossils. Trace fossils are, are basically not fossils, they are just traces of the fossils. You can imagine when you're laying on your bed, remember the bedding surface, and um, you know, you slept the whole night there and then you don't make your bed and you've got all these wrinkles and so that is traces of you. You're not dead anymore, it's just the traces. So same with the trace fossils. That's when you have uh, footprints, uh, tracks of different animals, or you got burrows on the beaches, or you can even find like coprolites, which means poops of different uh, animals. So this is the trace fossils. And just to end this with, what do you think you're seeing here? Yeah, it's really, really, really cool because look, you got ripple marks and they are uh, symmetrical ripple marks, which tells you that we are talking about a coastal uh, marine area. And then you got the, the mud cracks. So basically you can put this whole... Um, this whole picture on a shore, on a tidal flat, you know, in an area which is sometimes underwater, sometimes dry. So this is a typical marine tidal flat or the sand dunes, or no, it's, it's not a sand dune zone, it's right in front of the sand dunes, you know, where you walk on the beach, and when it gets dry, it, it gets mud cracked, and when it's wet, it's going to be underwater. And that's what shows when it's underwater, it's going to make the typical wave ripple. So it's really interesting that actually, if you go back in time, you'll see rocks just like this and you will be able to exactly pinpoint how did it form, which is to me, I'm pretty amazing. So these are the different sedimentary environments and for physical geology, in historical geology, we're going to learn these Thing much more detailed. We're going to talk about every single environment differently, separately. But here, all you have to know is that we have the continental environments, the transitional environments, and the marine. Marine environments, everything in the ocean. Transitional, everything which is influenced by the ocean, which means we're talking about beach, the deltas, the tidal flood, that kind of area. And the continental is everything on the continent, such as glaciers, streams, desert, lakes, uh, springs and groundwater, wind. This is all continental environment. And now we are at the classification of sedimentary rocks. And the classification happens based on, first of all, the origin of the sedimentary rocks, and then... Uh, So the classification basically happens based on the origin of the sedimentary rocks. So we will have clastic sedimentary rocks and chemical biochemical sedimentary rocks. Uh, one thing you have to know before we start is that the clay 
plus quartz, claminose plus quartz, so that claminose and quartz are the most common uh, minerals on the surface of this earth. And that is because they are extremely durable at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. So we're going to start um, talking about the clastic sedimentary rocks. And inside this group, the further classification happens by grain size. So this is the grain size chart, grain size chart, you have to know, starting with the gravel. In gravel, the grain size of the grains is larger than two millimeter. Uh, if you wanted to know one inch, one inch is equal to 2.4 centimeter. Point five four, sorry, two point five four centimeter, and one centimeter equal ten millimeters. So you can calculate over if you wish. So the gravel is when the grains in the sedimentary rock are larger than two millimeter. Then you got the sand in which the grain size between two millimeter and point oh six three millimeter. And the silt, which the grain size is 0.063 to 0.005 millimeter. And the clay, when the grain size is smaller than the 0.005 millimeter. Now, some of you could say that, what a crazy number there between the, the sand and the silt. However, in real life, they chose that grain size because that is the size of the lines on your finger. Therefore, when you touch sandstone, you can fill the grains. You know that the grains are bigger than the lines on your finger. Versus when you touch a siltstone, on the other hand, you can fill, you, I mean, you won't fill the grains. What you can feel is that the grains are smaller than your finger. And actually, the lines are going to fill up with those grains. So when you touch it, your hand ends up being the co color of the siltstone right there. When it's clay, when you touch it, it feels rather silky. It's really, really fine grain. So it's easy just by feeling and touching. You can tell these uh, grain sizes apart, especially when they are rough, so you can touch them. So let's start with the largest grain size, the larger than 2 millimeter, and then you have two chances. The first one is when the grains are rounded, like in this case right here, rounded pebbles. So you got rounded pebbles. See every single one of them rounded. And we call that conglomerate. It's written right here in me, so I don't have to. Conglomerate. I just put congra right here. Conglomerate. So when you have um, grain size larger than pebble or larger than two millimeter, we call it, and they are rounded, we call it conglomerate. And the next one is the brachia or bracha. That is when you have larger than two millimeter grain size particles and they are very, very angular, just like you see right here. It's extremely angular. The next group you have to know is the sandstone. Remember, sandstone is between um, two millimeter and 0 0.063 millimeter. These sandstones are important because they are 20% of all sedimentary rocks. And they give us information about the process they form by, the sorting, the, the shape of the grains, which indicate distance and the, the uh, carrying uh, material. And the mineral composition will tell us about the geology of the area, the distance, how, how long has it been transported, and also the climate, because if, if you have a very wet climate, the weathering is going faster. And if you have a dry climate, it goes slower. You will have to know three kinds of sandstone. The first one is the quartz sandstone. When you have quartz sandstone, it's 100% quartz. When there is a sandstone which has nothing but quartz, we also call it very mature. mature. Because it took enough, you know, it had enough time that everything else have weathered the way but the quartz. Remember, that is the most durable mineral along with the clays. 
So when, when you have a sandstone, which is 100% quartz, we call it mature. In that case, usually, of course, to look at the grain shape, you have to use a microscope, but all the grains are going to be rounded and they are very well sorted. So very well sorted, very, good, very, very well rounded, and uh, usually it's carried by the wind, either in the beach, on the beach, or in the desert. So this is what quartz sandstone is. The next one is the arcos. When you have arcos, uh, usually it uh, it will form after weathering of granite. Remember, granite have K feldspar. Arcos have about 25% orthoclase of K feldspar and about 75% quartz. Usually the, the sorting is not very good and the um, it's not very mature because it's full of K feldspar. So it's not that mature and it's... Um, less rounded and the sorting is not that good. Usually it forms close to the granite mountain so it's going to be close to the so-called source area where the sediment is coming from. And the last one is the gravaki. The gravaki composed of rock fragments, clays and quartz. Usually it's very pretty angular you know if you look at it under the microscope and uh, it is pretty immature also. So that's gray wacky. It's very typical dark gray. You can mix it even with basalt. So you have to really see that it has grains. And you can really put it under the microscope and you will be able to see that. Uh, the next one is the siltstone. Remember the siltstone is a new grain size category. It's between 0.063 and 0.005 millimeter. And mostly it contains quartz and clay minerals. Quartz and clay. Those are the two most... Um, durable uh, minerals on the surface of earth and then the last kind is the the mudstone or clay in this case or shale um, most of the time the mudstone is uh, very very fine fine grained it's less than 0 0.005 millimeter and when it splits into small layers we call it shale so this one here is a typical black shale and when you look at the sedimentary rocks, the color is not important. You can have any kind of color shale, any kind of color sandstone, any kind of color mudstone, anything. The color in the in case of sedimentary rocks has a very important meaning, and that that meaning is telling us how much oxygen was in the environment where it formed. When it's a dark color, usually that means that there is undecayed organics in it, undecayed like this black shale on decayed. And when you hit it with a hammer actually and smell it really quick, it smells bad because of the because of the hydrogen sulfide in it. That's like the rotten egg. It's very similar to that. So when you have a black rock like this, other than the fact that it formed in an environment where there was no oxygen, that's what you know about it. You don't know the shell because it's black, because it could be red, yellow, gray, black, any color. So remember, the color only have environmental importance. You cannot tell the rocks by their color. So when you practice in the lab, don't remember certain rocks because of the certain colors. That's true for igneous rock, but definitely not true for sedimentary. And this is where I talk about the, the, the color indicates, indicate organic matter. And um, actually the shale and mudstones are very important because it gives half of all the sedimentary rocks, um, basically, which can be formed in, in the world. The clays actually are very good, the mudstone and shale are very good for pottery, brick, china. So they have a lot of important applications. And this here is a typical black shale. We have some around Eagle Rock. So when you do your Eagle Rock field trip, you actually will see black shale. And now we are at the chemical and biochemical sedimentary rocks. And actually there has to be a lot of change here because I want you to have a big group name called carbonates here. C-A. 
R B O N A T E carbonate. That just means that all of these rats will have uh, CO3 as a polyatomic anion, it's a 3 with two negative charges, which will be fulfilled either with calcium or magnesium. And the other thing we know about this is that they all form in the tropics. So these guys all form around the equator, like 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. So this is the tropics. And they form from a lot of different animals, plus the coral reefs. So they are very, very typical, and they mostly form in the ocean. You will have to know a couple of different limestone. The first one is the oolitic limestone. <clears throat> when you look at the oolitic limestone, actually it's very, very similar to, to the sandstone, and when you touch it, it feels very similar. There is a major difference because it's calcium carbonates. These are the limestone now. The first one is the limestone group, and I think I have had that on the previous, yeah, limestone right here. So these are the limestones, and they are 10% of, of all the sediments, and they are mostly calcium carbonate. So in this case, calcium is the one which fulfills the, it's CA3, so, so sorry. So it's calcium, C, A, CO3, right here, CA, CO3. So it's calcium carbonate, and that's limestone, okay? Same as the calcite was, that's why when you put hydrochloric acid on it, it will effervesce. So drop one or two drop of hydrochloric acid into the limestone, and it's actually going to effervesce, makes the bubble. The C, the, those are CO2 bubbles. And uh, they will bubble out when you put the, the hydrochloric acid on the, on the carbonate, on the limestone, I should say. Now, in case of, uh, that's going to be the next one. So this here is the, uh, the carbonates in general. And the first type of limestone you'll have to know is the oolitic limestone, oolitic limestone. The oolitic limestone actually forms in, in coastal areas, underwater all the time, but very shallow water. So you're in the wave zone, and there are little rock fragments or mineral fragments in that shallow water, and as they're being moved back and forth, and the climate is relatively arid, as these little grains move back and forth, calcium carbonate will precipitate on top of the, the little fragments, and they end up having uh being beautiful two millimeter um sand sized low grains we call oolites oolites so they mean high energy arid environment so when you have oolitic limestone you know right away that it formed in the in the wave zone and that the climate had to be arid so it's amazing because whenever you see oolitic limestone you know that that's how it formed, which makes it really cool because it's a very environment-sensitive rock. means if you go back in time and look at this kind of rocks, you know what kind of climate was in that area. The next one is the coquina. When you have coquina, basically you can see that it's nothing but shell fragments with a lot of holes in them. So this is a perfect rock for insulation and a very good building material. They do build from it in Florida a lot. Like um, San Augustine, the fourth was built from Coquina there. But Coquina also means high energy environment, which means in the waves, where the wave breaks up the shell fragments. But if it was arid, it, we would have all oolites. But if it doesn't have any oolites, we know that it's a humid climate. So. This is like amazing reasoning, critical thinking, because you're able to put exact environment next to the rocks where it formed in. So it's really, really powerful, amazing tool here to know the rocks. The next one is the fossiliferous limestone. And I guess I have to stop right here 
because it's 20 minutes exactly, so I really have to stop. I see you in the next segment.